as we again study the Word of God, part two of the Word of God, let us petition the throne of our God. Father, you have blessed us with health and strength. You've blessed us with new mercies, and for that we are grateful. We thank you for the relationship that we have with you and that that relationship is growing day in and day out. We thank you for your word, that we're able to hide it within our hearts in order that we may not sin against you. Bless us, dear God, we do pray as we study your word. For your word gives us joy. Your word gives us peace. Your word gives us happiness. Bless us now. In your son Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. And again, as a recap of what we talked about in part one, it says, keep in your mind that the Bible is not a book of philosophy, although it is philosophical. Do not go to the Bible for a scientific dissertation. However, there is no discrepancy between learn, learned facts of science and the Bible. The Bible is not a book of history, but it is found to be accurate when recording history. The Bible was given to man from God, revealing Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and God the Son, the only Savior. He is the center. He's the circumference. It is Christ from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is as high above all other books as the heavens are above the earth. And again, someone has rightly said of the Bible that we are to read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be right. We found out in our last study that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And we're thankful to God that it is inspired. We found out that your faith cannot grow apart from the Word of God. We found out that we cannot preach apart from the Word of God and that the Bible is the only book that the Christian cannot do without. The Bible is the infallible Word of God. We found out that the Bible is an indispensable book. Even though men and women tried to get rid of it many centuries ago, but the Bible yet stands. For we read, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. We know that within the church of a living God, that the Bible is its authority. No matter what other book you may have, the word of God, the Bible, is our authority. It is the book that shall operate the church of God. When we last left off, we were talking about why you can have confidence in the Bible as the word of God. And the, the most important thing, well, the most important part of any structure of any building it's its foundation. It can be a beautiful building above ground, 
But if the foundation isn't secure, it's a worthless building. Countless thousands of hours each week are invested around the world in the work of God in one form or another. And we must be sure that our foundation is secure. The foundation for the work of the church is the word of God. If the Bible is our foundation, then our foundation is secure. Look, if you will, at the unity of the Bible. And the unity of the Bible within itself is a miracle because as we stated in part one of this lesson, the Bible was written over uh, 1,600 years, a period of 1,600 years, two different languages, and it was written by 40 different human secretaries. Again, look at the unity. 1,600 years, 40 different individuals, two different languages, and the unity is there. Every portion of the Bible agrees perfectly with every other portion. Without the hand of God in its writing, that would have been impossible. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 tells us, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of the scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy at any time was produced by the will of God, but holy men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The link between the Old Testament and the New Testament is quite amazing. It has been said that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The perfect unity between the Old Testament and the New Testament is quite outstanding. When you read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, you need to also read the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, and you will arrive at an understanding of what the atonement for our sin through the shed blood of the Lamb is really all about. There had to be a shedding of blood in order to purchase the redemption of sin for man. It takes the book of Daniel in the Old Testament to shed light on the book of Revelation in the New Testament. The 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament teaches us of one of the one who would be bruised for our iniquity. And then when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels in the New Testament bear out that truth in the record of Jesus Christ. Yes, he was bruised for our iniquity. One would never understand what the Apostle Paul meant when Paul referred to Christ as our Passover. And he said that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 in the New Testament. But you need to make that comparison because you need to go back and read about the Passover in the book of Exodus around chapter 12 in the Old Testament. It is this wonderful unity between the books of the Old Testament and the books of the New Testament that build confidence in the Bible as the Word of God. This kind of unity would be impossible in our own day of modern communication much less many centuries in the past when men couldn't communicate as freely with one another as we do today. We can see the division that we have within families, the divisions that we, ha we have within communities, the division that we even have within the United States of America, the division that we have in the world. And yet, we can look at 
the Word of God and we can see perfect unity. Just think, without telephone, without word processors, without iPads, without Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, without any form of social media, any technology at all, those 40 individuals over a period of 1,600 years moved by God wrote a book of perfect unity. This book has to be the Word of God. There's no other explanation for its unity. So I have confidence that this book is the Word of God because of the link that I have between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But brothers and sisters, I have confidence in the Bible and my confidence increase when I read of the many prophecies that has been fulfilled. If you wrote a list of predictions for this coming year, and 85 out of every 100 of your prediction came to pass, you'd be a wealthy individual. Soon, people would be saying that you are a great prophet. And that's just with 85 out of 100 prophecies being fulfilled. But yet, the Bible can claim an amazing record of 100% when it comes to the prophecies being true. 100%. Look at this list of prophecies, if you will, concerning Jesus Christ found in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, there's a prophecy that the Messiah would be born of the seed of a woman. True. In Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, the nations through which he would be born, the Jews, or the seed of Abraham. Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, from which of the 12 tribes would he come from? The tribe of Judah. 1 Samuel chapter 7, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. The exact family from the tribe of Judah through which the Redeemer would be born. The family of David. Michael chapter 5 and verse 2 talks about the town of his birth, Bethlehem. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, the exact time of his birth, 483 years after the end of the time of captivity for the Jews. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, that a forerunner would come before him, and that forerunner would be John the Baptist. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, riding upon a coat. Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13, his price of betrayal, 30 pieces of silver. Notice now, all of those prophecies about Jesus Christ were made a minimum, a minimum of 400 years before his birth. From Genesis chapter 3 
verse 15 all the way down to Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 and all of those scriptures in between talked about Jesus Christ a minimum of 400 years before his birth and every last one of the prophecies came to pass. The noted author, author Josh McDowell estimate the odds of such an event taking place by mere chance. He said it's probably about 160 billion to one. The prophecies of the Bible build confidence that this book is the very word of God. And one of the greatest proofs of the divine inspiration of the Bible is found in its great ability to change the lives of men and women, girls and boys, not only to change, but to transform people's lives. You can read in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, for whatever God says to us is full of living power. It is sharper than the sharpest dagger, cutting swift and deep into the innermost thoughts and desires with all their parts, exposing us for what we really are. Now the word quick here really means alive. The Bible is a living book. And according to that same verse, it's not only a living book, but it is a powerful book. The Bible has an influence upon the lives of people that no other book possesses. Now churches are filled with people whose lives have been changed by coming in contact with the Word of God. Churches are filled with people, whether it's virtual, in-person worship, whatever, but people whose lives have been transformed just from the Word of God. No other book has that kind of power, for no other book can claim to be the Word of God. Now, finally, let's just look at some, some suggestions on what we should do with the Word of God. What should I do as a Christian? What should I do as a child of God with the Bible? Now, if you have arrived at the conviction that the Bible is the very Word of God, that is divinely inspired and preserved, what should you do then with this book? You need to read it and study it personally. The Bible will do you no good sitting on a coffee table, end table, in your home. Open the Bible. Study the Bible personally so that you might become a workman who is approved of God and one who needeth not be ashamed. Oh, that's what 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 tell us. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but one who can rightly divide the word of truth. Secondly, we need to read it and teach it in our homes with our families gathered around. Much family strife could be resolved around a time of family devotion where the Bible is read and studied together. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 9, we find the importance of the Word of God within the home. It, 
It tells us to teach it to our children. It tells us when you rise up in the morning, talk about it. When you're riding along the road, talk about it. When you're just sitting down, talk about it. We must impart the word of God. We must train up our children in the way that they should go. P place the word of God within them so that even though they may get out, act up at time, at least we know that the word is in them and the word can bring them back to where they need to be. So we must read it, study it personally. We must read it, teach it in our home, with our families gathered around us. But then there ought to be some memorizing the word of God. Nothing will do us as much good in our lives as we're committing the word of God to our memory. It is this hidden word that will help us in our battle with sin because there will come a time in our lives when we will not have this book in our hand that we can fight the devil off, that we can open it up, find a particular passage of scripture that we need to read. We will not have it in our hand, but if we have taken the word of God, hid it in our heart, then when we are in a battle with Satan, in a battle with powers and principalities of this world. We can then draw on the knowledge that we have the word of God not only in our head, but it's in our heart, and we'll be able to draw on that word. Psalms 119 and verse 11 said, Your word, Lord, I hid in my heart, again, that I might not sin, against you. So I've got to read the word, study the word personally. I have to read it, teach it in my home, with my family gathered around, memorize the word, and then preach it in our churches. There's so much going on in our world today where people really don't want to hear sound doctrinal preaching. Many individuals today are more concerned about a message that will tickle their ears to tell them that I'm okay, you're okay. But the Word of God has a way of stepping on our toes. I don't know if you've ever been in church before and the preacher has been preaching and it looks as if the preacher is speaking directly to you. All the other people, the, all of the other parishioners, the congregants of that church, they're out of the picture. He's preaching, she's preaching directly to you. And that's just the way God's word is. God's word is medicine. Someone has once said that the church is nothing more than a hospital and all who attend are merely individuals with some form of sickness and that the Word of God is the medicine that has been prescribed for each of us. Preach the Word and preaching the Word of God will draw the blessings of God. And then once we have preached the Word, once we have studied the Word, meditated on the word, memorized the word. Once we have even gathered our families around us to teach them what God's word is all about, then we've got to walk the Bible, walk the word in our daily life. Psalms 119 and verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible will guide us through difficult times and help us face tough decisions that we all must make. How many of us during this pandemic has not turned to the Word of God? 
in order to try to get some relief, to get some words of encouragement, to help us to make it through these tough times. Because when we look out and we see the millions of people who have been affected by COVID-19 and the millions who have died around the world because of COVID-19. Those who are in the hospital and even as of this lesson, when we're talking about hospitalization rates increasing and the pandemic seem to be running rampant once again. We need some encouragement. We need something that we're not getting out of Washington, D.C. We need something to let us know that if we place our faith in God, that everything is going to be all right. We need a word today to tell us that God is still in control. Yes, we've had an election. Yes, we have a president and a vice president elect in the persons of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And yet, even that election at the time of this lesson is being litigated in courts all across this land and country. But we who are children of God, know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter what is happening in the land that our God is still in control. So I've got to walk the Bible. I must learn as James says in James chapter 1 and verse 22 I must learn to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word only. God has called for each of us to be doers. In the city of London, England, there stands a tall, impressive building called the Tower of London. The British crown jewels are kept in the tower. Also housed in that building is the sword of state, the official sword used for many centuries in the coronation ceremony. Bedecked with precious stone of every salt. It's an amazement to the eyes of all who behold it. But another sword far surpassed the sword of state in London. Its value is beyond earthly comparison. It's the sword of the spirit the word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. This is the only weapon for a child of God. We must not lack in understanding in its use for the do so is to leave ourselves open to the attack of our enemy. With the word of God we can fight the spiritual battle that Satan wages against us each and every day of our life, but not only fight the battle, but win the battle. Keep your Bible close at hand. Look at it every day. Hide it in your heart. Walk in its principles and its precept. Let it shine light on your pathway through life until it guides you safely home on the other side. Keep the word of God hidden in your heart because it is the word of God. Let us pray. God, once again, we thank you just for the privilege of sharing. Now bless us as we go about doing your will on this earth. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen.